REST versus GraphQL. You're probably thinking, ah, uh, this is one of those videos again where we're supposed to find out which one is better, but then it becomes lame. It depends on what you want to use it for. So, which one is better? Well, it depends. You know why? Because we're nuanced people. The world of software development is not black and white. It's 254 shades gray. 50. <laughs> Amateurs. So, we're going to dive into the details, talk about some pros and cons of REST and GraphQL. I'll show you a couple of examples, and then I'll give you some of my thoughts on when to use one over the other. But before we dive in, let's first talk about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. Skillshare has many classes on web development, programming in Python, software engineering, and software design. At the moment, I'm following Frank Kane's course on data science and machine learning with Python. It's really comprehensive. It contains lessons about statistics, data types, clustering algorithms, decision trees, it covers libraries such as Pandas, basically everything you need to know in order to get started. Skillshare is curated for learning. There are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes. So you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. The REST interface is already quite old. It was originated in 2000 by Roy Fielding in his PhD thesis, Architectural Styles and the Design of Network-Based Software Architectures. REST stands for Representational State Transfer the basic idea is that when you want to take some action on a resource, you send a request, an HTTP request, and the body of that request contains the desired new state, and the server will then reply with the actual state after handling the request. REST interfaces are therefore resource-oriented. This is different from the RPC-style interfaces, remote procedure calls, which are action-oriented. You call a remote function that performs a certain task, and you get the result back. For example, you could have an RPC set block title that you pass my title and get back OK instead of the new block. Now let's take a look at how we can create a simple REST interface in Python using Flask. This is a basic example of a REST API for blogs and blogs authors. I'm using Flask to create the API and then I'm defining a number of routes one for each of the API endpoints. So this route here is the root route and that just returns hello world. Let me start the server. And then when I switch to my browser, like so, and then I do this request. So here we have the local host and the port in this case is 5,000. So when I do this get request, which is basically what this is, then I'm going to get hello world as a return value. There's a couple of other things here as well. For example, I have a blogs route, which calls the all blogs function and then turns that into a JSON data structure. So I have a data.pi file as well in this project that provides me with a number of basic operations to do on data, on blogs and on authors. I have a bunch of classes here, like there's a blog class, so a blog has an ID, a title, content, and an author ID. I have a payload. This is basically what we're going to use when we update a blog, so we want to be able to update the title and the content of a blog post. And we have an author that has simply an ID and a name. Normally you would obviously have way more things in here, but this is just to give a simple example. And then I also have hard-coded here in the data.pi file, I have a number of blogs and a number of authors. Normally this would be a database, but since I don't want to talk too much about database stuff in this video, I just made a very simple thing like this. And now we have a couple of functions that we can use to read and write this data. So finally, I have a class not found error. That's basically an exception that's going to be raised when we couldn't find a blog at a given ID. And then I have a bunch of functions like this returns all the blogs. This gets a blog with a particular blog ID. This updates a blog. We have getting all the authors and getting a specific author. So these are just a couple of common operations you maybe want to do in a blog system. And as you can see in app.pi, I just add a couple of routes here. I have a route to get the blogs, a route to get the blog with a particular ID. This is how you set that up in Flask. So you provide the ID here as part of the route and then get passed as a parameter to the function. And same for the authors and for an author of a particular ID. So for example, let me switch back to the 
browser. And then when I'm going to put here something like this, this is going to give me all the blocks. So then I'm just getting this array of block objects in a JSON format. And I can also get a block with a particular ID. So let me get block with ID two, for example. And then we don't get anything because I think I have to put an S here. Yeah, there we go. So now we have to block with ID two. So very straightforward. Now, obviously, if you look back at the app.py file, I didn't add any anything else than get requests. If you want to update a block, well, then you have to add an API route for that. So currently I'm not doing that. So let's add a simple route here to also update the block. And that's actually relatively straightforward. So I can just add a route here, app.route. And then let's say we're going to use the same route, so block slash ID, and we're going to use, you could use a put request or you could use a post request like so. And now we have a post request and let's add a function here. Let's call that route update block. And you see that I'm using actually GitHub Copilot here. It's already suggesting the things that I should type. So basically we have an ID, that's a parameter and we get the payload. I'm not sure that this .json is actually going to work. I'm actually generally doing it like this with the get JSON function call. So that gives me the payload. And then we call update block. I pass the ID, but have to convert it to an integer because IDs are stored as an integer in the system and we pass the payload. And then we're also going to return the result of this update block function call. And what update block function call does is that it returns the updated block as you can see here. So going back into app.pi. So let's restart the server that happens automatically. And now let me move to another terminal. And now I'm going to place a post request and update a particular block. Let's just look back. So this is currently block two. So we have this title and we have this content. So now let's change the title of this particular block. So for that, I'm going to do this post request. So I'm sending a body with JSON data, which contains a title. That's what we're going to update. And we post it to this server URL slash blogs slash two. So that's going to update the second block for us like so. And now you see, we also get JSON back as a result with the updated title. And if I go to my browser again and I repeat this get request, you also see that the title is now updated. So this is how we set up a simple REST API. And as you can see, we have routes for blogs. We have also routes for authors. If you wanna introduce new concepts into the system like publishers or uh, books or anything else, you just have to add a separate route for this and then you can process, create, read, update, delete requests via that route. One thing that's not so great about this design is that we're directly returning the data that we get from operations such as get blog and update blog. And that might lead to security issues. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But this is basically how you set up a basic REST API. There are a couple of issues with REST interfaces. By the way, if you're enjoying the video so far, give it a thumbs up. That helps spread the word about this channel. First issue is that you kind of have to make sure yourself that your REST interface adheres to the standard. A good starting point to help you with this is Swagger and the OpenAI standard. They also provide tools to help you design your APIs while making sure they adhere to the standard. I'll put a link to Swagger and OpenAI in the description of this video. Another issue with REST interface that you'll see in this example is that here getting the author of a blog requires a separate request. You could implement a population mechanism of some kind, but there's not really any standard way of doing this. And that leads to having to coordinate several requests in the front end to get the data you need and waiting for these requests to complete, which ultimately slows down the user experience. A third issue is that REST doesn't enforce a distinction between the structure of the data in the database and the structure of the data that you receive and send via the API. This invites developers to just directly send back data retrieved from the database, leading to potential security issues. For example, you might accidentally send back information you don't want to be public, such as a user's email address or password. And if you're not careful, it's really easy to make mistakes here. And finally, with REST, there's no way to control how much data you get back from a request. Now, blogs are not that big, but if you have a document with a lot of fields, you might want to control this in some way. You could build something for that, but again, there's no standard way to do it in REST. 
GraphQL tries to find a solution to all of these issues. As opposed to REST, which has multiple endpoints and uses various HTTP verbs, you know, get, post, delete, etc., to interact with the server, GraphQL uses a single endpoint and the query language to interact with the server. The QL in GraphQL stands for query language. And what about the graph? Well, basically that illustrates the difference between REST and GraphQL, which is that GraphQL views the data as a graph structure where objects are connected by relationships and thus forming a graph. And this is then combined with the query language, which allows you to specify exactly what data you want to get back from the server. And more specifically, which part of the graph structure you want to retrieve. As opposed to REST, Getting blog posts and its associated authors is then handled in a single request. Furthermore, you define the interface with the GraphQL backend via a schema. And there you specify exactly what the data looks like. And this solves a lot of security issues. If you try to do something that's not specified in the GraphQL schema, you're going to get an error. So now let's turn our REST interface into a GraphQL interface and see how that works. So I've already done some of the scaffolding for the GraphQL example. This is basically what the main app file looks like. So I'm still using Flask to set up the actual server for this. But then for my GraphQL server, I'm using a library called Ariadne. And there is other libraries as well for GraphQL. You also have Graphene and Strawberry. They each have their pros and their cons. I might do a comparison of all these GraphQL libraries in the future. But basically, Ariadne is a wrapper library that allows you to easily define a GraphQL server with GraphQL types. And as you can see, there's a major difference between a REST API and a GraphQL API, which is that GraphQL just has two routes. There is a GET request that is actually used mainly to get a playground, so you have like automatically built in a web server where you can run queries and see what the result is. So that's this. Normally in production, you would switch this off. And then you have the main GraphQL interface, which is actually a post request to that same URL. So server slash GraphQL, or you can choose anything you like, but this is kind of the standard way to do it. And there it gets the JSON from the request because anything you do with GraphQL, any way that you interact with it is going to be through JSON. And then it's going to process that request. It creates a GraphQL schema, which defines the structure of the request that you can do to the GraphQL service. And then it runs that request through the schema and through the resolvers in that schema. And then it's going to return a JSON structure containing the result of that particular GraphQL request. And this part here, I basically copy pasted this from the Ariadne project website, we're not going to change this. This is, we're going to leave this as is. This is all boilerplate that we're going to need for our GraphQL server. And then handling the request and modeling that whole system is going to be different. It's going to happen somewhere else. So I did also a few extra things. So here we have a simple file that is there just to create a GraphQL schema. For the moment, that also doesn't do much. It's just relying on the type definition, which I'm taking from this file, and a mutation and a query. Now, in GraphQL, let me also show you in this file, there are two main ways that you're going to interact with the GraphQL service. One is by posting a query. That basically means that you're retrieving data. And the other is by doing a mutation. And a mutation basically means a change in some way. So these two things you're going to need. They're kind of similar to what you have in a um, in a REST API with a GET request versus a PUT, POST, or a DELETE request. So we have queries and mutations. And you always need to define these. And you can define your own custom versions of this later on. I'll show you in a minute. And then we have the type definition. In this case, the type definition is empty. So actually, this graphical service doesn't expose anything. And as you can see, I've here the file structure for this. So I made a schema folder that contains this create.pi and types.pi file. And then the app loads these and just creates the schema in this particular GraphQL route. So it's very basic at the moment. There's nothing in here dealing with blogs or authors yet. The first thing that I'm going to do is define a couple of types and queries. So let's start with the queries. And I'm going to add here to the main type def a type query which GitHub Copilot already fills in. And then we're going to have the blogs because we want to retrieve the blogs and that's going to return an array of blog. That's how we 
define it in GraphQL. Then we're going to have a block that we're going to get via an ID. And this is what uh, GitHub comes up with, but actually we want this ID to be not an int, but we want it to be an actual ID. So this is what we're going to do here. And this is also going to return a block with an exclamation mark, which means that this is either always going to return a block or it's going to raise an error. So exclamation mark means it's not an optional value, basically. And we're going to do the same thing for the authors. So I have here the authors, that's an array of a list of authors, and then I'm going to have author by ID, and that's going to return the author. So these are the basic queries that we also had in the previous REST API, and I define them right here. Now, of course, I'm using a couple of types. So I have blog here and author that are at the moment not defined. So let's define these as well. And in order to do that, I'm going to create another file here inside the schema folder that I'm going to call, let's start with the blog. So I'm going to call this blog.pi where I'm going to store the blog type data. So let me create a blog type def here, which is just a string constant containing the type definitions for the blog. And that's going to have a type blog like so. And there we're going to have an ID. Each blog is going to have a title. It's going to have content which is also a string, and there's going to be an author. And let's also put an exclamation mark behind that. Let's assume each block actually has an author. And then we have a brace that we still need to add. So this is basically our block type definition. And now what we can do is actually handle here the various queries that we defined in the types here. So we have blogs and we have getting a blog by ID. So these basically correspond to what we had in the REST API before. And these things, they're going to be part of this main query type thing that we have here. So blog and blogs are going to be part of this. And the way that you do it in Ariadne is like so. What we first need to do is import from schema.types the query because we're going to add the block queries here. So we're going to need that object. And then we're going to add a field to this. So query actually behaves like a decorator in Ariadne. So I can have a field here, and that's the field blocks because we're going to read all the blocks. And then I will add a function here. Let's call that resolve blocks. And that's going to get some parameters. So this info object, that's actually of type graph ql resolve info and this is going to return a list of blog and now of course we need a couple of imports to resolve all those things so what we will need is from graphql we're going to need graphql resolve info and from data we're going to need blog because that's what we're going to return. And we're also going to need all blocks and we're going to need get block as well. So all blocks and get blocks. Then our resolve here is actually really simple because here we're just going to return all blocks like so. And we can do the same thing for block with a particular ID. So let's also add another field to the query called blog. And let's define a function, resolve block. And this is going to get also the info object, but it's also going to get a block ID. So that's how we set up a simple resolve for blocks and for a particular block. And in order to support all these things, I need to also add this type definition that we just made here to the schema. So when I go back to create, I need to add it to the create schema function here. So let's add it here, block, type def and that's going to automatically import it like so. So now the type definition is also available to our schema and that means that it's exposed via the GraphQL API. So I'm going to run the application now. So now it started the GraphQL server. So when you have GraphQL server, you basically also have this playground which allows you to easily write queries and get the results. So for example, what I could do is write a query here and we're going to get all the blocks and for each block we want to have the id and we want to have the title and we want to have the content and then when i run this query i get the blocks just like when i 
used it with the REST API, but here I'm just defining it as a GraphQL query. So see, I didn't have to specify the endpoints. I'm specifying the way that queries and mutations are handled in GraphQL. And because in the query, we specify what we want to retrieve from the backend, we have a lot more control now over the data. So for example, if I just need the IDs of the blog, I can just remove these two things from the query, then run this query again, and then I just get the IDs. So this gives you on the front end, basically a lot more control over the data that you need and it reduces the amount of data that the server needs to send back to you and that will overall speed up your application. I wanna show you one more thing in this GraphQL example, which is to allow for mutations. So instead of just defining a type here, if we, let's say you wanna update the blog as well, well, then we're going to need an input, which is a blog payload and that's going to get a title. So that's not obligatory, it's optional. And then we also have a content. And then finally, we need a type mutation with which we can update the blog. So let's call that update blog and it's going to get an ID and a payload and it's going to return a blog. And then what we need to do in our GraphQL system is that we need to define a resolver for this update blog mutation. And maybe because it's Python, we should also name it like so to follow kind of the Python structure. You don't have to, you could also use the camel case version. The only thing that we're going to need is to add an extra import here, which is the mutation, because we're going to add a mutation. And then we're going to do exactly the same thing as we did with the query field. We're going to add a mutation field, and that's a update blog, and then we're going to write a resolve update block. So we see we already get that here. And that's going to call the update block function and then update the block and return that as a result. So it's very similar to how you would set it up in a REST interface, but here we're using resolvers to do it. And there's one more thing that I want to show you that's actually quite nice with GraphQL. And we kind of already did that when we specified the types, but we noted that if you look here in the blog tab, we have an author field, which returns the author. And that's the nice thing about GraphQL that you can create these kind of connections that kind of creates this graph-like structure that is so nice. Let me show you how that works. So in order to do this, I need to specify a special query type for blogs specifically. And we can do that right here. It's just one line of code with Ariadne. So I'm just going to create a blog query which is a so-called object type. And that's a blog, like so. That's our blog query object. And we can attach resolvers now to our blog object. And the resolver that we're going to add is the author field resolver. So let me add here a blog query field, which is called author. And then we have a resolve author resolve block author, you could also call it. So what uh, GitHub generates here is not entirely correct. In fact, this first thing that we have here, this is actually the blog. So the first thing that we get here in the resolver is the actual blog that this field belongs to. And then what this is going to return is of course the author. And then we're going to return get author, and then we give it the author ID of the blog, and we should access that through a dictionary. So this is then what happens. So let me save this. And now let's go back to our playground here. And now what I can do, oh, this doesn't work somehow. I think I forgot something somewhere over here. Let's see. So I need to add the block query to the schema. So let's import that here. And then let's add it to the list here. Blog query. Obviously, if you define a query object, you also need to make sure that it's part of the schema. So that's what I have now. So let's try this one more time. So now we're back in the playgrounds and initially we got the blocks like so, but now what we can do because of the author resolve that we just added, I can now write here author. And then from the author, I can get the ID and the name, for example. And now let's run this query. And you see that now for each block, we get the author. So this is exactly the graph-like structure that GraphQL allows you to create. And I don't want this video to be too much about GraphQL. It's mainly about the difference between REST and GraphQL. But here you see a major difference that instead of having to do two requests, like what you have to do with the REST interface, here you just add it to the query 
and then you get exactly the data that you need. Though GraphQL doesn't have many of the problems that the REST interface has, it also introduces some problems of its own. Let's look at some of the cons of GraphQL. One of the cons of GraphQL is that sending a request to the server is a bit more complicated than with a REST interface, since you have to specify the query or the mutation that you want to make. And with REST, that's just encoded in the endpoint and the HTTP verb. The second issue with GraphQL is that it suffers from the n plus one problem. If you retrieve a bunch of blogs with authors, a separate database request is going to be made for each author, and that potentially slows things down. In order to fix that, you need to introduce some kind of local caching mechanism in the backend to avoid all those different database requests, or a mechanism to group resolvers in GraphQL. Most GraphQL libraries don't offer something for that at the moment. Another thing that I think can be improved is the query language. It's quite verbose in some cases. For example, specifying mutation is a pain. You have to define variables both in the mutation name and in the mutation call. I think that can be shortened to make it easier to use. And finally, not everything in GraphQL is standardized. For example, it would be nice to have a standard way to do search with pagination, with page sizes and results, or using cursors or something like that. Also, having some standard options for authentications, roles, permissions would be a great improvement. I have a few thoughts about when to use REST interfaces versus when to use GraphQL. First, because REST interfaces are really simple to use, they're great for smaller applications and for public facing APIs. But really important, you have to take care of security. Only expose data that you want to be public. So make sure you use some kind of layered architecture where you explicitly translate data from the database into its public form. For more complex applications that are tightly integrated and need specific sets of data, GraphQL is really a great option. Your front end is going to be much easier to manage, especially if you use a GraphQL client like Apollo that supports things like automatic caching of local data, subscribing to changes, and more. I hope this video has been helpful. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it, and consider subscribing to my channel if you want to learn more about software design and development. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you soon.